All right, Proverbs 4.13. Carry out my instructions. Don't forget them. Everybody say, don't forget. For they will lead you to real living. Carry out my instructions. Don't forget them, for they will lead you to real living. Father God, in the name of Jesus, we thank you for the word today that the anointing destroys every yoke of bondage. I pray, Lord, that nobody would leave here like they have come in the name of Jesus. Speak to everyone's hearts. And Lord, I pray that this gospel of the kingdom will be preached to all the world. Lord, that all will hear. Send us to the nations, I pray, in the name of the Lord Jesus. And we thank you, Lord, that there is no bondage here, but the heavens are open today. Lord, if there be one here that does not know you, one that is backslidden, one that is away from you, I pray that, Lord, you would make it hot in here for them today. Let there be conviction in the house. In Jesus' mighty name, I pray. And Everybody said, amen. amen. Why don't you tell your neighbor, don't forget, and you can be seated, all right? Just say, don't forget. How many know we hear things? Uh, when I leave the house, uh, you know, uh, you, you don't forget your phone, don't forget the keys, don't forget to pay a bill. We hear all these things a lot. And uh, how many know there's sometimes we forget things? I was sitting, uh, I was checking in a hotel in Oklahoma in a small town, and I'm there with my wife, and a lady came up and hugged me. And she says, Doug, I haven't seen you since high school. And I didn't know who she was. All right? I forgot her name. And it was a bad thing. And I'm like, I'm tr I, I want to introduce her to my wife, but I don't know her name. I remember I, I, she was a cheerleader. I played ball, so I knew who she was. I just couldn't remember how many know we forget some things? Sometimes we forget some things, but I want to look to Hebrews 2, verse number 3. It says, how shall we escape if we neglect so great salvation, which at the first began to be spoken by the Lord and was confirmed unto us by them that heard him? How shall we escape if we neglect so great salvation? I was sitting on an airplane and I was headed to Honduras to do a crusade or a festival. And I'm sitting there, and uh, when I get on a plane, I usually put headphones on immediately. That way I don't have to talk to anybody. And that way I can study and do something, and I get something done uh, and be productive. And I have headphones on, and I'm sitting by a lady that I don't know, and, and I, I, I didn't say anything to her. I wasn't being rude. I was just like, let's just get this thing to Honduras. And I'm flying out of uh, uh, Hartford, Connecticut. You know, it's actually uh, uh, in Springfield, Massachusetts, but it's the Hartford Air Airport. And I'm flying there, and uh, uh, they bring the cart down the, the aisle to give you drinks and the little bag of peanuts that they bless you with, <laughs> unless you're allergic. And they give you those, and uh, that lady was trying to pull her tray down and she couldn't figure it out. And I just reach over and I helped her and the tray goes down and she, she starts talking. To me. So I take the headphones off. She said, oh, you must fly a lot. I said, yes, ma'am, I do. She said, what do you do? And I, when I, people ask me what I do on the plane, if I don't want to talk, I tell them I'm a preacher of the gospel uh, that, uh, of Jesus Christ. If I want them to talk, I say I'm a motivational speaker. So I didn't want to talk. I said, I'm a preacher of the gospel of Jesus Christ. And she looked at me and she said, oh. She said, listen, I've watched television and I heard a preacher say that you could know when you die, you go to heaven. She said, he used the word saved. She said, how can I know that when I die, I'll go to heaven? I'm going to tell you, I am ready to talk now. Because I feel like I caught the biggest fish in the ocean. I'm going to pull this in and I'm not going to break the line. And the, this fish is getting in the boat. And I began to tell her about Jesus Christ. And I began to talk about the cross of Calvary and how God loves you. And I said, you can get saved right here. She said, you don't have to do that at a church. I said, no, you can get saved right on the plane. 
I said, right here. But I said, now, if you want to get saved, there's something you're going to have to do. You're going to have to pray with me and not just pray in your head. You're going to have to pray out loud because Romans 10 says, if you confess with your mouth and believe with the heart. And I showed her that scripture. And she looked around that plane. She said, I said, are you willing to pray out loud with me? She looked around the plane. She said, well, nobody speaks English on this plane anyway. They won't know what I'm saying. Because we're going to Honduras. She prayed the sinner's prayer. She opened up her eyes. And when she opened up her eyes and I opened my eyes, tears were running down her face. And she was so excited because she now knew she was going to heaven. And she looked at me and she said, do you think my husband can get saved? Now, when I think about that story right there, I think that we need to realize that the Bible says in Hebrews 2 and 3, how shall we escape if we neglect so great salvation? We need to, number one today, don't forget that salvation is called great. Don't forget that salvation is great. That word great there is mighty. And the word uh, uh, salvation is the word soteria, save, deliver, preserve, prosper, heal. Great salvation. I'm talking about something today. I think it's something that we take for granted. But great salvation came by a great God's great heart, by great grace, by a great personal Savior. The Bible talks about many things that are great. Great lights, great whales, great cities, great wickedness, a great river, great sea, great joy. And you and I, we'll talk about a great team. We'll talk about a great deal. We'll talk about a great sale. We'll talk about a great house. We'll talk about a great school. But why are we silent about great salvation? Where would we be but for the blood of Jesus that saved us? Where would we be? Sometimes we look at people with judgment and we want to judge them with the judgment of man. But where would we be without the grace and mercy of an almighty God that had some mercy that pulled us out of the mountain? Fiery clay and set us upon a rock to stay. Why will we talk about all these things and we're silent about great salvation? Really, it says there in Hebrews, don't neglect. How shall we escape if we neglect so great a salvation? He's saying, don't be careless with salvation. Don't neglect salvation. I'm going to tell you today that I refuse to be quiet about salvation. I will not shut up about salvation. I'm going to preach the cross and Him crucified. This gospel right here that I'm preaching today, it is still the power of God. It is foolishness to some, but unto us which are saved, it is still the power of God. How shall they hear without a preacher? The Bible says the word is nigh thee, even in in thy mouth and in thy heart. That is the word of faith which we preach. Uh, like Jeremiah, it's uh, the word uh, is like fire shut up in my bones today. I cannot neglect the word of God and the salvation that comes by the blood of Jesus. This word will not return void, but it shall prosper in that which it is sent. Think about salvation, if you will. There were three crosses. There were two thieves, but the one on the middle, he was there different than the other two. He went there. He went there willingly. I will tell you, the other two went there dragging their heels. But yet he went there. He went there without sin. The other two had sin. How many know when Jesus went to the cross, he took your place and my place. We have all sinned and come short of the glory of God. The one in the middle, Jesus, is not guilty. The other two were guilty. He took our place. He was the sacrifice for us. And I will tell you today that salvation is free, but it's still not cheap. It was the precious blood of Jesus that was shed for you and I. It wasn't just a little blood coming out of his head and a little blood out of his hands and a little blood out of his feet. It wasn't just a little blood on his back, but his blood was poured out for you and I. When that uh, spear went into his thigh, he was emptied of his blood for your sin and my sin and gave me and you great salvation 
Somebody said, why is salvation so great? Salvation's great because of heaven. See, some people are like that woman on the plane. If I died, I, I, I'm not sure if I'd go to heaven or hell. I'm here to tell you because of salvation, I can know when I die, I go to heaven. 1 John 5, 13 says that we can know that we have eternal life. Luke chapter 10 says you can know your name is written in heaven. And Romans chapter 8 would signify to every one of us that we can know that we are a child of God. So if you're here today and you don't know if you died, you'd go to heaven or hell hell, I'm here to tell you at the end of this service, you're going to have an opportunity to receive great salvation and know that you're on your way to heaven. Somebody say amen. amen. See, we can know we have eternal life. Salvation is great because we receive a miracle. The Bible says in Isaiah that the Lord himself will give you a sign or a miracle. His name shall be called Emmanuel. I'm here to tell you Jesus is your miracle. Salvation only comes through Jesus. You can only get to the Father through Jesus Christ the Son. And today maybe you're here and you realize that uh, you uh, deserve to be condemned. But I'm here to tell you the Bible says there is no condemnation to them. They're in Christ Jesus. I'm telling you today get in Christ Jesus that's your miracle uh, salvation is great today because we become new creations in Christ Jesus think about that we may look the same on the outside we may have the same uh, uh, we be uh, recognized by our outside but on the inside I've been cleansed I've been changed uh, I'm going to tell you I am a new creation in Christ Jesus old things have passed away and all things have become new Salvation is great because when you're saved, you will miss the great tribulation. Somebody said, I don't know much about that. I'm going to tell you something. Or I don't even care about that. I'm going to tell you, you need to read about what happens after the rapture of the church. I'm here to tell you, there's not one of you that want to be here through the great tribulation. If you thought corona was bad, if you thought any persecution you've had has been bad, you don't want to be here when uh, uh, the grace of God stops and the devil wreaks havoc on this world. Salvation is great because you'll miss the great tribulation. Salvation is great because God loves you. See, somebody walked in here today. You said, I don't feel any love whatsoever. Nobody loves me. My family doesn't love me. My neighbors don't love me. Uh, my wife doesn't love me. I don't know what you're thinking. But the Bible says, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. That's what makes salvation so great. Because you receive the love of God when you are saved. Somebody say amen. amen. Salvation is great because it frees you from sin. Matthew 1, 21, and she sh shall bring forth a son and shall call his name Jesus. For he shall save his people from their sins. Salvation is great. Because it keeps you from hell fire. We don't talk about that very much. We don't like to talk about it. But I'm going to tell you, the Bible says there's a narrow way that leads to heaven. And there is a broad way that leads to destruction. Don't get on that road to the, that leads you to hell. But get on the road that leads you to heaven. And salvation is the road to heaven. Salvation is great because it keeps you from hell fire. Folks, I want to tell you something. God loves you more than the devil hates you today. The devil never sent his son to die on the cross for you. But God did because salvation is great. He sent his son to die on the cross for you. I watched a commercial one day. It was a Mercedes-Benz commercial. And the Mercedes-Benz, they ran the Mercedes-Benz with crash dummies into a wall. And they were talking to an engineer and they were talking about all the safety features the Mercedes-Benz has. They have patents on these safety features, but yet almost every other car maker in the world has copied their safety features that are patented. And they asked the engineer, why doesn't Mercedes-Benz sue these other car manufacturers for stealing their design? And the engineer said something like this. He said, some things in life are just too important not to share. Are you listening to me? 
Because in life, some things are just too important not to share. Salvation is so great, it's too important not to share. My goal in life is to take as many people to heaven with me as I can. I don't want hell to have any population. I want heaven to be populated. Some things are too important not to share. See, God is speaking to some of you about sharing uh, about this great salvation. I'm telling you, God's speaking to some of you. Look with me to Galatians chapter 2 and verse number 9. In Galatians chapter 2, verse 9 and 10, it says, And when James, Cephas, and John, who seemed to be pillars, perceived the grace that was given unto me, they gave to me and Barnabas the right hands of fellowship, that we should go unto the heathen and they unto the circumcision. Only they would that we should remember the poor the same which I also was forward to do. Now here, the leaders of the church are talking to Paul the Apostle. He wrote two-thirds of the New Testament. And they're telling him what to do. He is under their authority. They're saying, now, you keep preaching the gospel to the heathen. We'll preach to the Jew. But while you're at it, here's what they said. Remember the poor. While you're at it, number two, don't forget the poor. See, why we cannot neglect salvation and forget about salvation, don't forget the poor. See, people we would consider poor people in America have water. People that we would consider poor in America have access most of the time to food. You look at a place like Haiti. Today they have a man-made struggle. Are you understanding me? A man-made struggle. You say, what am I talking about? Well, the... You know, I, I don't want to make it all anybody mad, and I, I, and I got somebody from Haiti for sure here today. <laughs> but I'm more Haitian than they are, I probably. I'm just joking with you today. You know, most people left Haiti 25 years ago and never went back. I keep going back, so I'm more Haitian than most Haitians. But I love Haiti. But I'm going to say this, and people can disagree with this if they want. When the former president was there, that former president, one of the churches this church has been at, many of the people have been at, was built by Jimmy Swaggart many, many years ago, but we put a water well there. They have a school there in Trudenor, and the president that was assassinated a few years ago went to that school and to that church. The People that gave guns to the gang members were trying to get him out of being the president. So here's what happens. They get rid of him, but now only the bad guys have guns. They don't have the Second Amendment in Haiti. Okay, whatever. Only three people know what I'm talking about. Greg knows. Listen to me. So now, the fuel's being taken by the gang members. The missionaries coming in have stopped because they're getting kidnapped. The food supply has been taken by the gang members. So it's a man-made famine now. I don't know what the answer is. But I'm going to tell you, people need help. Water is available to buy. It used to be about 50 cents for five gallons, but if you figure, you know, an average shower is like 11 gallons of water. How much water we waste. But they don't do that. They're going to go to the river. India has tens of thousands of villages of people of 100,000 or more with no water unless the government brings it in. Where we're putting water in in Pakistan are children uh, that are uh, born into slavery. They have to make bricks when they should be going to school because their parents are slaves. They're slaves. And until their debt is paid, they're going to be a slave forever. But we can go in there and bring water and bring food to these people. They have some issues. 
Pakistan has issues. India has issues. Haiti has issues. Unrest. Roads are blocks. All these things. But it doesn't say in the Bible, remember the poor that don't have any issues. Because where would we be? We all had issues. Oh, some of you say, I didn't have any issues. Your wife knows all your issues. <laughs> and she's still married to you. Remember the poor. Don't forget the poor. Keep them in mind and feel enough to do something about it. Hebrews 13, 16. But to do good and to communicate, forget not. For with such sacrifices, God is well pleased. The Amplified Bible says, be generous and distribute and contribute to the needy. I've already told you we've done more than 200 water wells in Haiti, more than uh, 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 somewhere close to 50 in India, and even in the last month we've able, been able to do five in Pakistan. God is moving this direction, and uh, we're seeing uh, now we've fed more than 300,000 meals to hungry children, but the greatest thing about feeding a meal to a, a child is we present the gospel to them. Because I'm going to tell you, I can remember one little boy had knots on his head and on his arm. And I asked the pastor, what's wrong with that little boy? And they said, well, uh, uh, his parents beat him. Well, you know, no kid really needs to be beat. They might need to be spanked, but beating's a different story. But they don't have, you know, DHS. And I, I thought, you know what? The only love this kid may get is this meal and the gospel. And somebody hugged him today from our group, when he gets old, maybe the only thing that keeps him from being an ax murderer is somebody said, I love you, and God loves you. That's pretty extreme, but I don't know. I don't know what goes on in people's head, but maybe he'll remember somebody told him about the love of God. Listen, one of my friends, he's a businessman. He said, Doug, you need some passive income. I said, what in the world is passive income? He said, it's when you make money while you're sleeping or while you're on vacation. I said, well, when I go on vacation, it costs a lot more money than normal. And I said, my girls have all learned how to make Amazon work at night. So I don't have any passive income, but I was sitting in a chair doing absolutely nothing, all right? Nothing. Sitting there. Just relaxing, and I thought, you know what? I don't have passive income. But over these 250-some-plus water wells, somebody's getting a drink right now. Somebody's getting a drink. And the Bible says if you give a cup of water in his name, you'll not lose your reward. So I'm sitting there thinking, blessed, 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 blessed. Are you getting it? I'm passively blessed. The Bible says that we're to lay up treasures in heaven. The word treasures in the Greek means deposit. We're to deposit in heaven. See, some of us are working for our retirement. We're working, we're working, we're working, we're investing. But you know what? You need to invest where you're going to spend the most time. After we've been there 10,000 years. Luke 10, 2. Jesus said, The harvest is truly great, but the labors are few. Pray ye therefore the Lord of the harvest that he would send forth labors into his harvest. Number three, don't forget the harvest. Somebody said, Well, I, 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 don't really, I just give and I don't think about it anymore. What kind of farmer would I be if I did that? I plant seed and then blew it off. If you go to Oklahoma where I grew up out in the Northwest, I, it's just Hicksville, all right? Everybody talks like me. Only they wear boots and they have socks on. I think I got my wife's pants on, but I don't know. They look a little short. <laughs> but listen. Where I grew up, all we had is farms, oil, and gas, all right? So those are the things we, we live off of. But the farmer would plant seed in October. 
The harvest is coming in the next few weeks for the wheat. But if you drive out in the country, a farmer will be, the speed limit's 55 or 70. He's probably going to be driving 30 in his old truck, and he's going to be looking like this. He's looking in the field because he's looking after his seed, because he's watered it, he's weeded it. And when harvest comes, he doesn't go on vacation. It's the most important thing. These are harvest days. See, we say we love the Lord. He's the Lord of the harvest. You cannot love the Lord of the harvest without loving the harvest. See, there's one thing that none of us can do in heaven. You can't, you can't witness to somebody when you get to heaven. You remember the man that even went to hell? He said, I wish somebody needs to go tell my brothers. He was ready to witness in hell. They said they didn't believe when somebody told them it's too late. See, we lay up treasure here when we're to lay up treasure in heaven. You know what the treasure in heaven is? It's people. God so loved the world, he gave his son. See, you think about it. I saw a little TikTok or something, a reel. They showed a casket of a poor man and they showed a casket of a rich man. They're about the same size. And the truth is, doesn't matter what, when you die, how much you got, you can't take it with you. It won't fit in that casket. That lake house is not fitting in there. That boat's not fitting in there. I'm not against those things. That's not what I said. But I'm telling you, we work for those things and we forget about the harvest. Don't forget the harvest. The only thing you can bring to heaven with you is other people. 1 Corinthians 3, 9, For we are laborers together with God. You are God's husbandry. You are God's building. We're a team in this effort. We're a team in the harvest effort. All the servants of God must work together to get the job done. Now listen, I told you I grew up in northwest Oklahoma. Wheat harvest was going on, okay? We had wheat farmers in my dad's church. Some of them had 12,000 acres of wheat. One of them called my dad. My dad pastored the largest church in our community. Had about 800 people in the church and And the, uh, one of the farmers called and said, Brother Eccles, he said, we're in the harvest. He said, we have an emergency. My brother-in-law was driving the truck from the field to the grain elevator. See, they cut the wheat. They, it goes in the combine. Then it goes in the back of a truck. You take it to the grain elevator. That's where you get paid. If it doesn't get to the grain elevator, you don't get paid. He said, my brother-in-law was driving the, grain, uh, the truck to the grain elevator. He has fallen sick. They put him in the hospital. He said, do you know anybody else that could help drive the truck from the field to the grain elevator? My dad said, uh, look, Brother Dwayne, I'll call you back. He hung up the phone, and immediately he called him back. I'm sitting there. My dad pastors the largest church in town. There's always stuff going on. Somebody's sick. Somebody needs help. Some, you know, somebody's mad. Oh. Everybody wants to be the pastor until they're the pastor. Because they got to put up with people like you. Tell your neighbor he's not talking about me. All right, come on. My dad called him back. He said, look, he goes, I got a lot to do. He said, but I'm going to put it all on hold. I'm, I'll be out and uh, as soon as I can get my clothes changed, I'll be out there to drive the truck all day. I went out there with my dad. He drove the truck all day back and forth. He taught me something. When there's harvest, harvest is the most important thing. Folks, I'm going to tell you today, the harvest is important. There are people that need Jesus. I got two things I do. Preach the gospel. Bless the poor. And I'm going to ask you right now, before we do anything, we're going to give an altar call. But I, I don't want to, I want to have plenty of time to pray with people. But I want to ask today, if you want to give, to preach the gospel, bless the poor. You want to do a water well? I think we could have five or six water wells today for $1,500. I 
once you start getting ready to give, all right? You, you're wondering what I'm doing. We're taking an offering. You're going to help with the harvest. Ask the Lord what he'd have you to do today. Ask the Lord what he'd have you to do. Some of you couldn't do a whole one. You can do a half of one. Some of you could do a third of a well. Listen, by October, we need $50,000. You say that's a lot of money. It's not really when you bite it down to 50 people giving $1,000. But we're going to see over 200,000 people saved in the five days. We're going to have over 200,000 out the first night. And if we have miracles the first night, we'll have much more than 200,000. We're believing for that. You can be a part of that. See, we work together with God. We're a team. And when we see one person saved, you're going to be just get as much reward as I get for that person getting saved. And when we drill one water well, you get just as much reward as I get for drilling that well. We work together. We're a team.